Thank you. Uh, basically, uh, just quickly, uh, my disclosures are here. Every medication I discuss in this talk uh, is not approved in adult or pediatric IBD by the FDA. All the data I give from this talk will be from adult studies, and I want to emphasize, even though it may be okay to extrapolate some of this data to the pediatric population, this data should not be extrapolated to very young children with inflammatory bowel disease, especially those with suspected immune deficiencies. In other words, you don't want to necessarily immunosuppress an immune deficient young child. So as uh, Dr. Baldassano emphasized, it's really incredibly important that we try to optimize our anti-TNF therapy in those patients that actually require anti-TNF, which is why I'm still of the step up uh, mentality where I usually will give immune modulators a try, even though we know anti-TNFs are more effective because you can capture a subset of patients with that set of drugs. In contrast, if you lose response or anti-TNFs fail, especially if you've used two of them, your options are really quite limited. The first thing you need to do is to weigh the benefit to the risk ratio of anything else you additionally do. In someone with ulcerative colitis, it's clearly failed anti-TNF. Uh, I think especially if these are ill patients in the hospital, colectomy with or without a pouch uh, may well be the preferred option to throwing more immunosuppression at them. In Crohn's disease, as uh, Bob said, think hard, is there some sort of surgically uh, treatable lesion, such as a stricture, such as an anastomotic narrowing. Even without a fibrotic lesion, you may have a segment of very diseased bowel that can be removed, and milder Crohn's that the anti-TNF is helping. And these patients, a limited resection may be helpful. Of course, in the more severe patients, especially with perianal disease, diversion may be needed, and with very sick colons, even in Crohn's, you may need to do a colectomy and an ostomy. Ask the question, especially in Crohn's, is long-term nutritional therapy an option? There have been a number of talks here and lots of published data that says, at least for induction, if you can take a patient to drink elemental formula, either by mouth or by tube, or polymeric formula, you may be able to induce a remission at least by yourself time. And while we do have data on rescue medications uh, in Crohn's and UC, the data is actually quite limited we, uh, if you fail anti-TNF. There's a paper by Dr. Hyams again, natalizumab for Crohn's disease going back about 10 years. That's a drug we commonly use. Very nice, stu nice study just published in JAMA this month, randomized placebo-controlled trial of thalidomide for pediatric Crohn's disease. And for years, even before anti-TNF, we utilized tacrolimus or cyclosporin for ulcerative colitis, but these are really short-term medications that you're looking at to cool a patient down and as a bridge to some other therapy. Well, help is on the way, maybe. There are three drugs that might be helpful here that are coming out. One is ustekinumab, which we utilize in Crohn's disease. A second is tofacitinib in ulcerative colitis and vetalizumab and ulcerative colitis and maybe Crohn's. These all have different mechanisms of action, and I really want to review their mechanisms of action, not just the clinical trials. You need to start, however, with the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. And what we currently believe is that IBD results when you have defective luminal handling or processing of microbial antigens in the gut, perhaps with an altered microbiome, and you have derangements in innate immunity by cells like dendritic cells, and if you turn on the IL-12, IL-23 pathway, which activates helper 1 T cells, you end up with Crohn's disease. In contrast, the pathways that generate ulcerative colitis are less well known, but we believe T helper 2 cells are turned on, and that IL-23 is also maybe involved here, and then an area that's not well studied are the suppressor or the regulatory T cells that may play an important role in downregulating intestinal inflammation when you get it. 
So what you see here is the IL-12, IL-23 pathway may be central to both the pathogenesis of Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. And that brings me to our first drug, which is ustekinumab, or Stellara in Crohn's disease. This is an antibody to interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. It hits the P40 subunit, which is present in both. It's approved for use in psoriasis. And a nice study recently published in the New England Journal of a phase three trial looked at 526 adults from 153 patients, and you had three different doses as well as placebo. Their inclusion criteria were Crohn's for at least three months, active Crohn's, and many of them, most of them actually had to fail anti-TNF therapy. They were allowed, however, to stay on their immunomodulators. And what you have in the week six response is about 35% of the ustekinumab group had improved versus 23% of placebo. This was a six month trial, but the response was fairly robust. Again, 42% ustekinumab compared to 27% placebo. And this is not bad in anti-TNF failure patients. A couple of caveats about the study, though. The mucosal healing evaluation was limited, uh, and so we don't have kind of the state-of-the-art primary endpoint that the FDA is starting to ask for. Nevertheless, if you look at C-reactive protein, and this is basically placebo here versus ustekinumab, with this is placebo pre and post, two different groups, and then subcutaneous ustekinumab, what you actually see here is a decline in CRP. So ustekinumab works. Serious adverse events seem to be comparable to other anti-TNFs or other biologics. There were serious infections, again, out of 500 people in seven patients, uh, six of them in the ustekinumab group during induction and 11 patients, four in the ustekinumab group during maintenance. Important to realize that, of course, patients on placebo with bad Crohn's disease can get serious infection. Antibodies in this short-term study are rare. There was one small basal cell cancer. And infusion reactions, quote, were about 5% across the board, including in the placebo group. And even in Sonic, people saw infusion reactions to, to sham infusions. The psoriasis trial, and this has been used quite extensively in psoriasis, suggests an overall good safety profile with no significant increase in infections or cardiovascular events. So in summary, this drug, while we need more data and will eventually need, F obviously need FDA approval, may well be a player in uh, TNF refractory patients or maybe even in TNF naive patients. Before I move on to the other trials, I want to quickly give an intermission and talk about what a Mayo score is, because that's something that we commonly hear about in these clinical trials. And basically, the Mayo score includes three physician assessments, well-being, stool frequency, the amount of blood in the stool. But what makes the Mayo score of a lot of interest, particularly the regulatory agencies, is it also uh, basically includes an endoscopic scoring component. This is a zero, which in essence is relatively normal mucosa, and you go up to one more severe, two moderate, three quite severe, and this is increasingly being utilized. Again, there's been some work done on this, but I'll tell you, it's pretty hard to tell a two from a three and sometimes a one from a two. So we need a lot more work on the Mayo score, particularly in pediatrics. But now let's move on to our next molecule, tofacitinib. Tofacitinib is a small molecule, the only one I'll discuss today that's not a biologic, and it works inside the cell to inhibit lymphocyte activation in response to cytokines. So a cytokine binds to a cytokine receptor and then one of the important signals in transducing and activating the lymphocyte is a protein called JAK, which in turn activates a protein called STAT, which in turn activates, basically generates nuclear transcription. You get more cytokine, you get more inflammation. Tofacitinib 
works right here. It blocks jack and therefore it inhibits cytokine signaling. It's been approved for rheumatoid arthritis that's not responded to methotrexate. It is metabolized by the liver and a nice phase two clinical trial suggests efficacy in ulcerative colitis. Again, Dr. Sandborn, here's the phase two placebo randomized control trial of tofacitinib. You had 194 adults with active ulcerative colitis assigned to four different doses of tofacitinib versus placebo. They needed to have a Mayo score of six to 12, so active colitis, and they also needed to have active UC on endoscopy. Remember, that Mayo score of two to three, pretty sick colon. And if you look at the group, about 40% had failed immune modulators and 30% had previously received anti-TNFs. This was a short-term trial, though, only two months. So here's the results. Clinical remission again, only two months, but you had 48% of the tofacitinib uh, group in remission versus about 10% of placebo. And endoscopic remission was actually also improved. 30% on tofacitinib versus 2% on placebo. So this does appear to help not only clinical symptoms, but also result on mucosal healing and endoscopic improvement in a significant number of patients. So should you run out and use this drug? You know, it has been approved, as I said, for rheumatoid arthritis. I would be careful with this one. Uh, based on what's out there now, in the rheumatology population, there's a lot of adverse events associated with this medicine. Myelosuppression, lipid abnormality, specifically an increase in both LDL and HDL, and some patents, patients actually need statins to control it. Serious infections, pneumonia, cellulitis, zoster, UTI, liver function abnormalities, and there have even been malignancies, including lymphoma reported. So, while this probably is an effective drug, it might be a little riskier than some of the other things, and we certainly need more data, and I know that they're working on larger phase three trials already, so hopefully we'll have more data. The last molecule I wanna discuss is vetalizumab. Again, third mechanism of action. The first one blocks IL-12, IL-23, that's ustekinumab. The last one inhibits intercellular lymphocyte activation. This one is an anti-integrin molecule that blocks leukocyte migration out of blood vessels. And we know for there to be colitis, white cells have to move out of blood vessels and get into the lamin appropriate to cause inflammation. So what is this? It's a humanized IgG1 monoclonal antibody to alpha-4 beta-7 integrin. It modulates the gut but not brain lymphocyte tra uh, trafficking. In other words, it's like Tysabri, natalizumab, but it doesn't get into the brain, we think. So hopefully lower risk of JC virus, infection of the brain, less risk of PML compared to natalizumab. And nice study published recently, New England Journal of Medicine, Huge study, 374 patients in vedalizumab versus placebo, 521 patients in open-label vedalizumab. Again, you needed to be sick, Mayo score six to 12, endoscopy subscore at least two, so the colon looks sick. They got two doses for induction and then also a maintenance dose uh, protocol. By week six, 47% responded to vedalizumab versus 25% to placebo, and remission was a little bit lower because, of course, that's a subset of the responders, but still statistically significant. Here's what happens, though, by week 52, which is what you really care about. You have remission in the responders, and you have to keep, be careful of that. They always enrich their population to just pick these guys. So 25% of patients overall you had remission, 45% of those getting monthly vedalizumab, 42% getting it every other month, and 16% of those randomized to placebo. And you can see if you take those responders and you continue them on vedalizumab, they stay in remission. If you put them on placebo, their disease activity goes up. One last thing I want to emphasize, 
we are going to be arguing with the insurance companies to get access to these drugs. We already are. And sometimes they deny it, saying it's experimental in children under 18. Very important you have this guidance from the FDA, which was published back in the early 80s, believe it or not, that clearly states off-label use does not necessarily mean experimental, okay? In other words, you don't have to discriminate against children. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act does not, however, limit the manner in which a physician may use an approved drug. Once a product has been approved for marketing, a physician may prescribe it for uses or in treatment regimens or patient populations that are not included in approved labeling. Such unapproved, or more precisely, unlabeled uses may be appropriate and rational in certain circumstances and may, in fact, reflect approaches to drug therapy that have been extensively reported in the medical literature. So you really do, and this is what we do every day with our letters of medical necessity, advocate for your patients. There will be inevitably a five to 10 year lag between pa these, the time these drugs are approved in adults and approved by children. In the meantime, sick children that require them should continue to get them. So in conclusion, options for our patients with IBD who respond poorly to biologics are limited. There are three new drugs with potential IBD, but with limited data, really just limited to adults, especially not much data in children. And these drugs I discussed are ustekinumab, IL-1223 uh, antibody, tofacinib, a small molecule that in inhibits cytokine lymphocyte activation, and vedolizumab, an anti-integrin blocker. The first two are FDA approved for other indications besides IBD, and I suspect vedolizumab within the next year or two should get uh, FDA approval for adult ulcerative colitis. Thank you.